Hello, and welcome to Mark and Carrie Spring Spring Break Edition. You know, what is it? Spring Break time. <laughs> Woohoo! Carrie, from... are you calling from Cancun? <laughs> Actually, Miami. So I'm here with my drink with an umbrella in it. Excellent. If you did that in London, it would actually be an umbrella. Yeah, not a little like paper umbrella. <laughs> it's an actual Are, real umbrella. Yeah. Are you in Cancun? Uh, no, sadly, I'm in my basement. In fact, I was meant to be with you doing this live, and then my day blew up for reasons that I don't know. How, we don't need to let anybody else know, but it's just <laughs> one of those days. So, uh, so anyway, we're here at spring break. Spring break's that time when sort of you know I don't know if un- undergrads realize this, but they're actually doing the sort of the the celebration of Dionysus or something like this, but they don't know that. When no, doing right, it's like break. renewal and like something. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, right? and unfortunately, the world we live in isn't anything like that because what's top of the news on your mind? I Right, I mean, this is, you know, the land of terrible transitions to Ukraine and what's uh, what's happening. And um, the I think the, the I mean, the, the most recent thing as I stumble and mumble around trying to get the timeline right in my head is Biden's speech in Poland uh, late last week. And um, him saying that essentially Putin would have to leave, quote unquote, regime change. And now the Biden administration having to walk that back. But, you know, seemingly, again, from an observational point of view and not having any real sense of the foreign policy stakes, are that wasn't he just being honest about that Putin has to leave? I mean, I understand there's the diplomatic side of things, but it seemed like it was just a break that the ad libbing was was actually a moment of honesty. Um, and maybe that was why um, so many people, you know, have forced the Biden administration to um, to backfill on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's all true, but I mean, you just don't ad lib this stuff, and you don't ad lib it particularly with somebody who is not just the focal point of power, is actually the only person that really matters in the system that's doing the war stuff, right? So if and you know, apparently he has. I don't know if it's an autobiography or whatever, but he's quoted at one point about talking about watching a cornered rat in a building and realizing that like once it was cornered, it would do anything to escape this sort of stuff. So this is a guy who was traumatized apparently by Muammar Gaddafi's capture and execution. Uh, this is somebody who doubled down in Syria basically to help out somebody he saw as a kindred spirit. So when you turn around and say, you know, regime change, you have to go. It's not like we're going to take, we're going to give you some money and you can go live on your boat because we've also confiscated your boat. <laughs> yeah. There's there's nowhere for him to go. So essentially, you're saying, you know what? There's no off ramp now. There's no ability to sort of, you know, deal with it. Well, if that's the case, then what you're saying is NATO has to fight. Mm-hmm. And what we know is the Germans have now said, yes, we will finally build an army. Takes a wee bit of time to do yeah. that. Apparently, last year. I think the Bundeswehr had four helicopters that worked. Mm-hmm. Four. Um, half of their tanks, which have they've been downsizing for 20 years, actually work. Uh, it's going to take five years for them to be combat ready. So if you're going to open your mouth and say stuff like that and you really don't have a plan for how to make it happen, particularly when there's those big things called nuclear weapons on the other side, yeah. it's better if you just keep your mouth shut. Well, yeah, and your point about, like, right, this is not the moment to go off script. I it is, I am curious, it seems like on a personal psychological level with Putin is that he's become more and more isolated within his group of advisors as well. There's a very small number of people that he, you know, on that 500 foot long table that he even lets <laughs> like cl- within close proximity to him. So, I mean, your point about he's making all the decisions, I think is like he is the one person yeah, making he is all the, the decisions. The, the one thing I can't stop laughing about in that one, though, is every time I see that very long table, <laughs> I keep thinking that this is actually a Mel Brooks film, because what Mel right. Brooks would do is every time you do the table, it would be even longer yeah and it would just get longer every single time and it's almost as if it looks that way it's like and now he's going to put somebody you know they've got binoculars basically trying to find them at the end of the table by this point i can see that scene in in my head and also the number of people would get smaller and smaller so the binocular man would be like the last person um at the at the end of the table what are your thoughts about the economic sanctions and just sanctions kind of in general i've been curious reading you know that mcdonald's and apple have decided to not not do business in Russia. Do, do they just go turn it back on then when things stop? When the fighting stops? Like what? What's you? You're asking. This is it. You're asking the right questions. I mean, so uh, Liz Truss, who's the British Foreign Secretary, 
um, came out the other day and said, you know, well, you know, if we get to a ceasefire and, you know, we can basically figure out some kind of settlement out of this, then, you know, we can lift the sanctions. It's like, really? I'm not sure that you have that kind of on-off switch on this type of stuff. And also, very much on the same line as you see with China, but to a lesser degree, there is a real attempt by the Putin regime to build this kind of siege mentality and siege economy, where they really are decoupled from the West and are just in antagonistic opposition all the time. So it's not clear that there's a great way back in for these firms. I saw some numbers today that basically the disinvestment uh, is equivalent to about 12% of GDP. That's going to hurt. And, uh, you know, the Germans may not be able to move very fast on a military front, but on an energy front, whoa, if their promises are halfway true, they're planning to build floating liquid natural gas stations and invest in new ships, whether they can actually find the gas is another thing. Mm -hmm. But this is going to turbocharge their sort of green transition and the investments in that field as well. So, yeah, there's definitely big consequences from this, but it's hard to read them in a kind of straight line, X leads to Y, and if you do Y, then you get Z. Yeah, just doesn't yeah. seem to be working that way. Yeah, I, I, you, you hope that, I mean, you hope that this, the headlines that Russia is reassessing its strategy or Zelensky is now talking about Ukraine as a quote-unquote neutral area, that these are, you know, good signs that things may be wrapping up. But even saying that sounds feels sort of ridiculous like it's just gonna be like a neat bow on it and then we'll just all move on to something else yeah there is so there's part of this as well that was kind of interesting is i think about it this way what putin did was he bought he built himself the best 20th century army you possibly could and then tried to deploy it in the 21st century and what i mean by that is it's still 20 percent dependent on conscripts who absolutely don't want to be there it's, it's geared up to fight tank battles against people who are using fifth generation anti-tank weapons, which are portable, incredibly accurate and incredibly deadly. Uh, this is a, wor a world of drones, whereby basically switchblade drones can hover over the battlefield for 40 minutes and then just drop down on, on a piece of armor. So he's facing a kind of a stalemate. Unless, of course, the West, you know, really can't deliver more weapons or choose not mm -hmm. to deliver more weapons. But, you know, the Ukrainians have been fighting for a month and it's not as if they've got several armies in reserve that are going to come and, you know, pick up the slack. So in a sense, both sides are being desperately worn out, mm -hmm. right? literally, literally and physically exhausted. And, and Russia's strategy, which seems to be some kind of medieval siege warfare with 20th century weapons, is not just expensive, it's incredibly counterproductive. I mean, you destroy the city, you kill 100,000 people, what do you gain for that? How does that possibly help any of your objectives? Right. And then the West can't doesn't want to look like they're just appeasers. So if they allow for the Donbass region or, you know, what to that, like you get this and then is, you know, what all the speculation has been, then is it just, you know, kicking the can down Yeah, the exactly. And, and if yeah. this is really based upon a kind of notion that Putin has supposedly of a kind of 19th century revanchist who sees himself in the lineage of the czars like there's no such thing as property rights or independence or you know national determination there's what i give out as the czar and essentially ukraine has violated what i've given you so i'm taking it back does he stop there i mean yeah. he has made some pretty crappy comments about poland mm -hmm. and the Balts. All of those countries are intensely nervous about what's going on. Will they agree to some kind of settlement? Do they have mm -hmm. leverage on some kind of settlement? And the biggest one, of course, that Europe's just beginning to face up to is they're probably going to have 10 to 12. If this go continues to go south, you're talking 10 to 12 to 20 million people mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. refugees. Now, if politics in 2015-16 kicked off with Merkel, and 2 million immigrants, actually just 1 million for Germany, 2 million in total. And then the solution was to, to basically pay Turkey money to stop everyone else coming through. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to have half the population in Eastern Europe moving towards Western Europe. How that gets played out politically and how that's paid for, that's a huge other set of issues. Yeah, that's such a great point. And that, I mean, the pressure is on Europe. The pressure isn't on the United States. I mean, just for, because of geographic proximity. And so we are miles away. Yeah. The US yep. says, oh, we'll take one of those to it, you know, X number of million of people. And we look, we try to pretend we're princes for saying yes to that. So, yeah. Ugh. So, yes, it's horrible and it continues to be horrid. Yes. Other horrid news. Um, 
the, keep going, keep ri- going. Rising in interest rates and the global debt crisis. I saw Sri Lanka, like, I mean, they're in total default or about to hit default, right? Um, as one of the examples of the global south debt crisis. Um, what's happening? And then I have another question I've been thinking a lot about. All right. So so what, what's happening? All of this goes back, as many things do, to 2008. So when you cut interest rates in the core countries, the rich countries, basically to zero, people still have to put their money to work. There's a huge amount of money out there that needs to be invested for everything from pensions to you know uh, investment funds, etc. And if you're getting the square root of nothing for investing in the core, you go out elsewhere. So this is when you started to get huge amounts of money flowing into these so-called you know, EMs, as they're sometimes called emerging markets. So Brazil, Turkey, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, etc. So all of that money's flying in at this point in time. And, you know, it's, and it's, we've seen this before. This is the East Asian financial crisis and other places. These are relatively small economies dealing with very large volumes of cash. There's only so much you can do before you start just building office buildings that nobody will move mm-hmm. into. So you do a lot of relatively unproductive investment. And it's fine so long as rates are low and you can just keep turning it over. But when rates rise, what happens is basically the people who are there say, well, I'm not making any money on this. I can get 3% for just kepping up in treasuries with all the money starts to move in the other direction so you got all that money pouring out what happens then is to keep that investment in their country those countries have to raise interest rates even more they're coming out and or dealing with a pandemic and disruption and everything else at the same time and these countries are just in bad fiscal shape because of all that consequently it's very fragile this is one of the reasons they'll never talk about this in public but the Fed, because of the role of the dollar, we've spoken about this before, mm-hmm. is de facto the world's central bank. And a lot of people here are wondering why, if the US is 7% inflation, Powell's talking a good game by raising things to 2% or 2.25 or even 3 because that leaves you with a negative real rate, right? If inflation's at 7 and you raise to 3, right, the real rate's negative 4. So why would you do this? And the answer is very simple. If he pushes interest rates up enough to actually kill American inflation, he will detonate all that debt all around the world in these EMs, causing a bigger crisis than coping with the inflation ever would. So that was one of my questions is, I mean, so I've been trying to learn about inflation at at a very elementary level. And I mean- That's a good good luck because you know what? Everybody makes it up. Nobody really knows what it is. But I mean, it's supply and demand, right? That everybody now Uh, wants Maybe, it's also expectations. It's also Uh, expectations. So Uh, anyway, you go, give me your version of it. Let's see where it goes. The supply and demand. So I, okay. everyone wants a computer, and so the the price goes up on the computer because like the the guts to make a computer are have gone up, and it costs more, and supply chain, and like a million other little things that are increasing the price on the computer, and so the cost increases. But if that's the case, then how can the government deal with all the million little things that are causing the price to actually increase? Whoa, well, there you've hit on it, right? So if you go on my Twitter feed, you'll find something I posted, uh, I think it was last week, um, in reply to a, some questions for a podcast I did in the UK. And I did a conversation between uh, a, a mother and her daughter. And it went like this, because this answers your question directly. Okay. okay. So... Um, Mummy, why are the prices of everything going up? Well, sweetie, you see, it's because of that idiot idea we had to make everything you could possibly need in the furthest possible away part of the planet through 26 different steps. And it turned out that COVID and now a war in Ukraine has made that a really bad idea. That's all broken. The prices are going up. Okay, I get that. But why then does the Bank of England, insert your central bank, why does mm-hmm. the Bank of X then want to make more money expensive, make, make money more expensive? Because if it does that, surely the same people who now don't have it enough to make ends meet will be even poorer. Well, sweetie, you're being quite insightful, that's true. Uh, but you see, it's not really about fairness. What it is is about protecting the value of asset holders. And it's basically about, as ever, kind of making sure that you know you get rid of the high prices by essentially rationing how expensive mm-hmm. things are by pushing the prices up by making money more expensive. But, mommy, that's not really fair, is it? Oh, sweetie, don't be a communist. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> and that, in a nutshell, is that side of the story. The other part of it is the really weird bit is the the inflation expectation story. So the supply and demand thing is totally right when it's exactly what you're talking about, like broken supply chains. I mean, let's give the better example. We all wanted iPads. Why do we want iPads? Because we're stuck in the house during the pandemic. So all the chips that would have went into the dashboard of cars, right, mm -hmm. went into iPads. Now you got to basically turn all that around and then go back to making the cars. So guess what? There's a shortage of cars. So the price goes up. Dum, dead simple, right? What they worry about, though, is what's called the expectations underneath this, by which they mean if you start to think that prices are rising, you then kind of anticipate the price rise. You'll mm -hmm. put your prices up because other prices are going up, which makes other people think that all the other prices are going up. So everybody puts... So this is, this is they call it the unhinging of expectations. And that can have its own independent effect. It's a purely psychological or crowd effect. But you can see how that works. The third one, though, which is indistinguishable from that, is simple price gouging. I mean, go look at the profit margins and returns on America's oil firms just now. They're through the roof. And mm -hmm. are they pumping more gas to lower the price? Are they? Hell, they're coming up with all the excuses about everything from green this and green that to like fracking and we can't turn it on or whatever. Why? Because they're making hand of money hand over fist. They're making super profits. Right, so price gouging. Go look at the price of an airline ticket just now. I mean, seriously, you need to sell your kidney. It's yes, unbelievable, agreed. right? And why is that? Because the prices have gone up on the fuel. Well, actually, these companies all buy forward contracts several months out. So their fuel prices are hedged. So they are not doing that for that reason, right? If they are, they've been caught short on their own fuel prices. So, you know, a lot of this is also price gouging. So all of that's going into it at the same time. I was wondering that. But even on a super simple thing, coffee, like, I, my, I feel like I'm now paying $6 for a cup of coffee. I when, know. And I'm like, but what is that? So the your second example makes a lot of sense to be in that, you know, the coffee shop around the corner has increased it by 50 cents and then the next place increases it and, and so on so, and so forth. Um, well, one thing that we haven't heard or I've heard very little of is the R word, which is recession. Mm -hmm. Is there I mean, is this on is this to come next? After inflation, then are we because then you feel like and we'll talk about this in a second reelection for Biden. If the R word gets thrown into things like he's just totally sunk. So this is fascinating. People love the 1970s, and not just because <laughs> of the hair and the fashion and, and the, you know, the invention of disco and all the good, Starsky and Hutch, and other things that went on in the 70s. But because it's this kind of period in economic history where there's a kind of, I'm writing a paper about this with an economist called Isabel Weber, about the settled histories that sort of populate mm -hmm. our understanding of the economy. And there's a particular understanding of the 70s and what the 70s were about, which is about labor and inflation and so on and so forth. And then there are certain lessons from this, like Nixon tried price controls and it was a disaster, so you never do this sort of stuff. Yeah. And you start to actually poke into this and look into it. Like the story doesn't hold at all. We have a preferred history that excu excludes certain things because it allows us to basically make claims in the future, right? Don't do that. You'll go back to the mm -hmm. 70s, right? This mm -hmm. sort of stuff, right? So financial people love this thing called yield curves. So basically, the yield on treasuries of different maturities, and they get very excited when the yields invert. So what does that mean? It means that basically you're going to get more money in the present than you would in the future mm -hmm. in terms of your return on your bond. And why is that weird? It would imply that you've got less confidence about the future than you do in the present. So therefore, there's probably going to be a recession coming up or the various versions mm -hmm. of the logic, but it's something like this, right? So uh, it looks like, you know, we're, we're heading for a recession. All right, hang on. Growth last quarter was 5.6%. Unemployment is at 38 Yes, but we have inflation. Now you throw all that together and everyone just starts going, it's the 70s, it's mm -hmm. the 70s. And it's like, it can't be the 70s. We don't live in the 70s anymore. It was 50 years ago. The economy is completely different. There was no such thing as a digital business. Mm -hmm. Services were a smaller part of the economy by 50%, right? So no, it's not the 70s. But it is interestingly like the 70s in the sense that if you were in 1969, the economy looked absolutely fabulous. Mm. And if you were in 1972, it didn't look mm. quite so fabulous, mm -hmm. right? And people are wondering, given these very conflicting data, uh, you know, which way is it going to trend? Right. Is it going to be like growth basically disappears because of inflation and unemployment yes. goes up, so-called stagflation, yep. right? Or is it the case that if the war in Ukraine manages to sort itself out, 
and supply chain problems go back to normalizing the way they were mm -hmm. before the invasion. Maybe a year from now, inflationary pressures start to abate, in which case you continue the type of recovery that we were having out of COVID, which if you go back and look at the numbers was pretty extraordinary. So, yeah, it's a very mixed bag. I mean, this really confirms my own cynical suspicions that the six dollars a gallon on gas is really just is just gouging. I mean, it's just gouging. The, and the fact that Saudi Arabia refuses to actually pump it because they hate Biden and they hate anybody <laughs> who wants to destroy their business model. Right. So if you're vaguely green in any way at all, right. it's like, no, you don't get gas. Right. Uh, um, so this that was super helpful. And I can be even more um, cynical about when I you know pay my seven dollars for gas and a couple a coffee and if you yeah, feel even worse about that it is interesting though thinking about does the does what is happening in ukraine have electoral advantages for those leaders that are up for re-election this year um macron there's a summer election in france right um yeah. And of course, the midterms coming up in the U.S. Schultz's numbers look pretty high after um, after yeah after a shaky start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So 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 let me get you in on this one then, right? We've spoken about this many times before. Basically, the Democrats and Biden are going to get murdered Ugh, in twenty two yeah. in the midterms and and going to lose in twenty four. Does that still? I mean, put the gaff apart. Like put put the and we will destroy and regime change everything. Yeah, bad idea, right? Put all that to one side. Is this actually stabilizing his numbers in any way? I mean, unemployment's at a thirty forty year know, low, right? right? He's got a, yeah, but at the same time, if you look at the Michigan confidence data, right, and you split it out, Democrats think the economy is improving, and guess what? Republicans think it's the worst economy <laughs> yeah, ever, yeah, right? Yeah. So even that's become partisan. How how does this play out for Biden and the Democrats? I mean, you, the foreign policy stuff, right? Americans, we don't even you know know our state capitals, so it's. I mean, your foreign policy just does not um, any. Um, crucial element in the decision making if you're going to vote for. Uh, for, for really? Me, I mean, think about 2001. I mean, you know, think about 9-11. But I right? think that Didn't was that stuff count. That was a rally around the flag moment, right? It was clear there is an enemy. It's right? true. It's actually attacking the American yeah. directly. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That is different. So yeah, you're right. If there was like a another instance of that on American soil, I think that certainly could. But in the face of that not happening, I think it's all culture war stuff, which you saw you know, over the last week right. with the new Supreme Court uh, nominee and all the theatrics. So I didn't, I didn't see any of that. Tell me about it. H how awful was it? I mean, it was just like put your head in your hands and shake your head, <laughs> and then just laugh because it was just so ludicrous. So I mean, all the what was the? Give me, give me, give me your favorite ludicrous bits. The one that I think got a lot of play was Ted Cruz's. He put up a big poster, you know, of an anti. The title of the book is "Anti-Racist Baby," and whether she thought that critical race theory was appropriate. So it's touching on critical race theory, education, you know, the all the hot buttons. Is stuff there right really now. a book called "Anti-Racist Baby"? Yes, yeah, and it shot to number one on Amazon as well. So. Ted Ted Cruz Fantastic. did, yeah. Ted Cruz did the did the writer a good favor on that, but Katanji Brown Jackson, the the nominee, um, and sat through. I think it was eleven hours, something like that, of t over two days of of hearings. And I just imagine, I can't imagine just even just sitting there for eleven hours and hearing people go drone on and on and on. But um, but I the usual suspects of Tom Cotton, Josh Hawley, you know, did their Ty Cruz um, all did their theatrics, and I, you you know, and you just kind of have to shrug your shoulders because I guess you you could expect uh, could expect that it is um, uh, the vote. I think they're hoping for early late next week and it looks as though mm -hmm. um uh, joe mansions that signal that he's going to vote for her so she will um be it appears that she will be approved in the uh, in the senate and then just like a historical note in that how close the votes now are i mean used i think ruth bader ginsburg was like 98 to 2 or something now it's mm -hmm. all like you know 50 48 something like that absolutely everything is divided no matter yeah. what i mean it's yeah. incredible actually go back to ukraine for a second i mean it's the one thing that's interesting whereby you have unanimity in the democrats in the sense that they've all become cold warriors again and it's the republicans that are split because the Trumpists don't know what to do or which way to jump. Yes, right. Yeah, is Putin like the villain or the the non? Yeah, exactly. Or the, or the, the the hero we're not allowed yes. to talk about. It's, yes, it's kid god. Yeah, I mean, guy, come on, really. Um, Florida, Florida. So there's uh, when I think of Florida, the words Miami and um, can I say can I say the word gay? 
I come to mind so, yeah. as being something that actually has happened in Florida and continues to happen in Florida. I believe that Florida has gay people and they have a thriving gay community. But now we're not allowed to talk about it. Is that right? Well, and, and in, of, of course, this is within, within schools. I mean, Republicans have found that talking about schools and parents are the, it really gets them, mobilizes people. And so the, the technical, um, the bill, I just want to flip, so if there's paper shuffling, that's what it is, is actually called the Parental Rights and Education Bill. So, I mean, that's really hitting on parents need to, you know, should have a say over what their kids learn um, and um, and they should intervene if there's something that, that they don't like. Uh, I mean, the text of the bill, and you'll appreciate this as a policy person, is very vague and very gray and that, you know, it's very subject to interpretation as well and because it includes, quote unquote, instruction and discussion. And so if instruction or discussion happens within the classroom, that's where a parent could then intervene. So, I mean, it's really, I mean, DeSantis signed it, but it's all. But the reason we have schools is to keep kids away from their parents. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, the, the the one thing we've learned in two hundred years of edu- mass education is like, you know, it's nice to have the parents on top, but you never want them on top. No, and over the last two years too, right? I mean, parents are like, I should not yeah, be teaching my kids. Totally, yeah. Yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah, so so let's go back to the electoral advantage thing, right? Yeah. So let's say that Biden at least gets some solidity out of the fact that the economy isn't completely mm-hmm. awful, and you know, there's a war on, and seems to be. He He's not completely dropping the ball so far. We're still alive. Let's let's hope it continues. Um, is the culture war enough to keep the Republican momentum going? I mean, what's keeping this? Why do we think that they're going to get a landslide when all they talk about is anti-racist babies and, and school gay stuff? Yeah. Why is that yeah. enough? You know, it's a good question. And I just read this paper that showed that actually the electoral advantage with the gerrymandered uh, districts is not actually totally Republican. And actually, it might lean a little bit towards the Democrats. So, I mean, to your point about that, you know, why do we think this is going to happen? I mean, some of it I do think is the lamestream media. But also, I guess, because in the off year elections, we saw Republicans do pretty well and in, in elections that we wouldn't necessarily think, for example, New Jersey, that the Republican guy came right. as close as he did. Yeah, and there was Virginia. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, but I, you do kind of wonder the economy's boom, you know, kind of booming along, and if it's just on culture war stuff, how bad do the Republican or how bad do the Democrats get beat? I think the one sign that I have is just that I mean, Biden's his numbers are low. I mean, they do seem to have stabilized in maybe the low forties, but they're still pretty low. And I think Democrats just look kind of like disorganized, like they always do. So yeah, yeah, they always do. That's true. Yeah, I was actually talking to someone about the Brown-Jackson hearings and thinking to myself, you know, it's almost as if the Democrats have a department that says, let's find a candidate who's uniquely appealing to us that we can then put up in front of the, the, the Republicans so they will go completely bonkers, Yeah, right? Because, you know, her demographic, her class, everything, right? That is exactly what they're acting against. And if you had some way of channeling that to your own electoral advantage, right, that would be one thing. But it doesn't seem to be that's the case, right? It doesn't seem to be joined up thinking on this one, right? You put someone out that you think is appealing to your base or morally you should have someone like this on the court because you support diversity and difference, all totally fine. But you know when you put that out there, this is just fuel for their culture war. Yes. And if all they're running on is the, the, the culture war and it seems to be working, right? So it's just, again, you know, it, it, if the Democrats have a strategy, it is inscrutable at best. Well, and I think what was interesting in that the Republican strategy against specifically Ketanji Brown Jackson was, I mean, one of the critiques from the Republicans was that she went to Harvard Law School and everybody on the court currently went to Harvard <laughs> Law School. So you're like, but, and also a black woman would have had because you would never allow someone who didn't go to Harvard, you know, so there's all this stuff right, going yeah, on. Exactly. So, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I think to, exactly to your point that they couldn't really find anything specific to attack her on because, I mean, uh, even some of her decisions that I think they did try and some of the um, cases that she had uh, that she had delivered judgment on, even that was felt pretty uh, pretty squishy. So I, I'm, uh, you know, I, it'll be awesome if she gets um, if she gets a, approved by the Senate. And I also think. One last thing, and this is not a new point, is that I think it's really important on the court to, that we would now have two 
uh, to black jurists and that Clarence Thomas would no longer be the singular voice on race on the court. Um, I think it provides she provides a younger. She is a woman. I mean, there's a lot of different things that she perspectives that she would bring that Clarence Thomas does not. And, um, you know, that's a whole another dissertation, I guess. So that's a whole other <laughs> conversation yeah. about his wife basically yes. being a QAnon troll. Yes. But, you know, but let's not go there just now. Yeah. Um, tell, so uh, another one about American politics Abortion politics happens everywhere, right? There are there are pro life groups in every country, and in certain moments they can become very influential. Brazil in the last election, for example, right? There's a Poland at certain points, Ireland, you know, going yeah. the other way in a sense, right? So at certain moments it happens, but America seems to have this thing where it is literally, you know, a permanent coalition. It's like prohibition was at the you know the turn of the century. It's a social movement that never declines, and it's got this one issue, and it keeps going. Does this matter? I mean, is this there's a cre- what, tell me about this crazy abortion bill about preborn child that's coming was it Idaho or In something Idaho, like this? What's this one? Yeah, and it's what's that all about? It's based on lawsuits that people within the family can sue an abortion provider for on behalf of the preborn child, and so it's again based on lawsuits um, that if uh, the the let, we'll just say the mom of the family gets an abortion, the father, the aunt, the uncle could sue the abortion provider for this. I mean, the governor, even when he signed it, questioned its constitutionality, but just, I mean, that he signed it, yes, but just that there are all these bills, I think 20 plus at the state level Mm -hmm. that are following the Texas model for this. And it's, um, and is, you know, it's the same sad story that poor women are going to have fewer and fewer options and women who have the means are going to be able to and it's just you know it just widens that divide even yeah it's just the class politics of access yeah. that's yeah. really yep, but, exactly. but to me i'm always fascinated by you know this happens in areas that are never going to vote democrat yeah so what's that's the point? point i mean is yeah. it just punishing the poor there's no electoral advantage to doing this Right. Idaho can do this stuff. It's not going to tip a national election. Right. You're, and you're right. Texas can do this. All And right. I, I mean, from, you know, from thinking about it from, as a political scientist, of course, it solidifies those particular states. And then it just those red walls or blue wall, whatever, you know, it solidifies all of that even more because then, you know, the Idaho does this. It makes it even redder. And then it makes Washington even bluer because, you know, they want to make sure that there is access to uh, to um, to women's health I it just the polarization i think just becomes more intense that happens so let's talk about something we haven't spoken about for a while which normally would be a good thing except it's yeah. been replaced by stuff that's possibly even worse trump Ugh. um he he keeps getting more and more money i mean it's unbelievable the guys he's making more money than he did as a businessman <laughs> um does he still call the shots in the republicans the way that he did you know right after the election or is it a case of like having all that money, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, he's the guy in charge? How, how do you read all that? Well, I think because he's so bad with money that in some way, like if this was like someone who knew, you know, to, to what to do with a dollar, you might be a little bit more worried. But he's now because he has real or someone has told him or he realizes that his endorsements don't aren't having the legs that he thought they would. He's now pulling them back or waiting to give endorsements in hopes to see whether the, his preferred candidate, you know, goes down in flames or not. Um, so I, I the calling of the shots, I I I. I think it's becoming less and less. And he has all this money. One doesn't know what he's going to do with it. Seemingly he can't do anything with it. His whole social network or whatever, his Facebook yeah. that he started, like, didn't go anywhere. So I I also feel like this is a way, and I hate to keep eating up on media, but as a way for them to keep Trump in the media, in, you know, as part of the headlines, just to keep people, um, you know, clicking. I, I don't. I, you know, who, prediction is bad. I, I question whether or not he has the the power that a lot a lot of people think that he does. So when it comes round to sort of the Republican, you know, primaries when they start doing this yeah. again, he's going to walk out as the big guy on stage. He wants the gig. You know, do you think he still got it? I mean, a while ago you had a clear shot at it. Oh gosh. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it depends on does Biden run. If Biden runs or not, if they and if he doesn't, if Biden doesn't run, who then wins? I think, you know, and this is um, I've heard this from a bunch of different pundits that if it's Kamala, for example, which I think would be a tough I don't know that she would necessarily be the nominee, then Trump would run because it's because Mm -hmm. she'd be a weak candidate um, coming out of a vice presidency that hasn't really done her many favors. 
numbers. No, absolutely not. It's like yeah. it's, it, it, I'm almost amazed that Biden hasn't actually made her charge d'affaires for Ukraine. I know, God. I mean, it's, but it's just like, oh look, yes. there's a total. So yes. why don't you go deal with that one? So uh, light, light-ish topics. Um, light-ish. I don't know if you saw that William and Catherine. Though you know, some people like them call them Kathy and Bill did a tour of the Caribbean, <laughs> um, and but there's a lot of backlash around this because there was no apology for the royal family's role in the Atlantic slave trade. I think the closest that William came was to say some something like it was terrible, or you know, something really like silly, yes. like seemed kind of fluffy. The, the uh, type of thing that like if you didn't say it's because it's kind of like saying you know. This is air, and yeah. we breathe air. It's like, like <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. slavery's bad. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. if you were going to give me a slavery's good line, we'd yeah. have something to talk yeah. about. Right. Completely anodyne, right? There was also the yes. photo op that went really horribly wrong with, like, you know, the local kids putting their fingers through the fence and, like, the two gorgeous white people standing there going like this. Yeah, yeah there, was, there was a few rough moments. But ultimately, they went there to basically get so that Jamaica could say, right, now sod off, we're a republic. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there were all sorts of, of the protests in Jamaica, I thought were pretty, you know, um, they were not quiet protests or small protests uh, either. Um, I also was watching their feed and I just had to say there were so many quotes from Bob Marley. And I thought, is there, is there no one else to quote, quote from except Bob Marley? I just anyway, I sometimes question who is writing these uh, writing these posts. Uh, I'm them. sure they'll be questioning them as well. But the one thing is you, the one thing, you know, is they've got more competent staff than Prince Andrew. Oh, well, <laughs> I mean, does it does? <laughs> The bar is low. The bar is low. The bar is very, very low yeah. indeed. So speaking of lowering the bar, yeah. I mean, I never watched the Oscars. I can't yeah. stand it. I think it's ridiculous. I've never enjoyed it. Uh, so anyway, I woke up this morning and I switched on the phone and I'm lying in bed, scro- doom scrolling yeah. as yeah. one does. And I see this thing about basically uh, Will, S- Will Smith slapping Chris Rock. And I thought it was like when he was up for his acceptance and he like playfully did yeah, something. Yeah. But he just got up, right? Yeah. And I don't know if you've seen the the uncensored a bit because they had on Australian TV <laughs> yes. and stuff like that. And he's, you know, he's he's using quite some colourful language as well for doing up. for doing yeah. this sort of stuff. And it was, it was, it was almost, it was like to me, it was just like, well, that's the detonation of that event. Oh, totally. Thank you. I mean, there are multiple angles, but I was with you doom scrolling this morning, and I so of course thought it was like part of the part of it as well. Right. And then when he starts yelling, you're like, oh no, this is this is not part of it. I guess I was just. Like I was mostly struck by how personal it was. It felt to, it felt very, obviously very personal to him to then get up on stage and do what he did. But I had a more sort of philosophical question for you, and and that is, it, I mean, the Oscars. I'm with you, ridiculous. But also, you know, declining viewership, blah blah blah, all of that. Does this signal sort of the end of movies with streaming and that, you know, where it just yeah. released all the time? I think it time? is. I think you're right. I think you're. Right. So I'll give you an example of this, right? I have no desire to go back to a movie theater. Yeah. Like, just personally. And it's been building for a long time, right? It's been building for the fact that, like, you know, you go out and, you know, they try and make it nice. You can get yourself a drink. Great. Right? Because, <laughs> uh, you know, I was associated, you know, getting sloshed with movies. Um there's a smell of popcorn. There's a 50-50 chance that some Egypt beside you is going to talk halfway through yeah. the film, right? It's, and this has been building for a long time. This is not like the... And then, of course, you know, there is the greater than zero, but nonetheless very small probability somebody's going to walk in with an AR-15, right? Oh. So you're like, Meh, maybe. And uh, what was it that we watched? Uh, we watched The House of Gucci. Oh, Oh, which is brilliant. Oh. I gotta say, it's oh, very, it very good. Okay. Yeah, it's it's like the type of film that, like, I mean, it's set in the sort of the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and it's the type of film that you get then. It's that okay. kind of like Godfather esque without the mafia thing, okay. sort of like dark family stuff, uh-huh. which is also sort of absurdist in some level. Um, but anyway, you know, I, we, we watch this, and there's so many platforms and so many options and so many different ways that you can see movies now. It's like I can sit downstairs in basically my own movie theater mm-hmm. and watch this, and and it's way better. Yeah, yeah. So about two months ago, I read something, and it went like this: right, American vehicle producers have committed to spend x billion dollars whatever mm-hmm. it is like 350 billion dollars 200 billion dollars on basically bringing out green vehicles in the next year alone and isn't that impressive until you realize that apple netflix and whoever it was amazon each are going to spend more than that on content oh, 
<laughs> exactly, right. So they're spending billions, yeah. Yeah. billions on content. It's like, do you think they're going to split this up with AMC? No, and that's the, so I actually went for the first time since when you know 2019 saw batman but when at like 10 o'clock on monday 10 10 a.m to avoid all the stuff that you just described and this was a three-hour movie i mean it took up my entire monday because you know i didn't Mm -hmm. but it was i mean i was kind of disappointed like you know till still still kind of smelled in there i was worried about like getting headlights or something and so it wasn't i mean it was nice but it wasn't any nicer than being you know at home watching uh watching batman so i do kind of wonder about that and it's you know given that the revenue structure is only only allows for Batman to actually make money. Yeah. You, I mean, they're pumping all this money into it, but what are they actually getting out of that? I, it's definitely um, a question mark. In any case, so we've killed the movie and we're moving on. That's it. We, we live in hell and we've killed movies. Next week. <laughs> Um, well, we will be back and to talk more about how much the world is probably falling apart, but maybe there'll be some optimism out there. And, um, and, but always great to see you. Yeah, it's always a pleasure. Let's get together for the, uh, it'll probably be end of April optimism episode and we'll see hey, where it I goes. I like that. I like that. All one. right. Till soon then. Bye everyone. Thanks for listening.